Section 79 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 79. War between China and Japan by W. A. P. Morton. Once upon a time, says a Japanese Aesop, the fish of the sea were thrown into consternation by the appearance of a new enemy, a man with a net and drag calling a council to provide for their safety. One proposed this, another that. The clam said that for himself he had no fear. He had only to close his shell to keep out all enemies. Splash! came the drag. The fish scattered, and he lay snug until all was quiet. Then, cautiously peeping out, he saw scrawled on an opposite wall, this clam, two cents, and he knew that he was sold. At the epoch of the Opium War, the attitude of China and Japan toward the outside world was identical. From that point, or to be exact, from 1854, the date of our first treaty with Japan, their policies diverge. Compelled to abandon her old exclusiveness, China has yielded as little as possible. Japan renounced hers without waiting for the application of force. Every step in Japan's progress has intensified the old animosity. China hates her as a traitor to the Asiatic traditions and she despises China as a laggard in the race. The first aggressions came from the side of Japan, as might have been expected from her awakened energies. She began with the absorption of Liu Chiu, which China regarded as her vassal, though the little kingdom, for its own purposes, had maintained a divided allegiance. Her next move was a descent on Formosa, ostensibly to punish the savages of the eastern coast for murdering the crew of a Liu Chiwan junk, in reality with the intention of occupying a port, if not the whole of that island. The right to do so the Japanese defended by specious arguments drawn from text writers on international law. These batteries the Chinese easily silence, as I can testify, having had something to do with the loading of their guns. The contest would not have ended without drawing blood if the British minister, Sir Thomas Wade, had not come forward as peacemaker and persuaded the invaders to withdraw on the payment of a small indemnity, which, to save the face of China, was considered as compensation for war material left on the island. A third storm center was Korea. Confessedly a vassal of China, the hermit kingdom had been unwisely permitted to send embassies and enter into direct treaty relations with foreign courts, making the Korean capital a nest of intrigue. In 1878, the destruction of the Japanese consulate at Seoul came very near embroiling the two empires. In the dispute which followed, the Japanese won a diplomatic victory. China weakly consented to something like a dual control, which naturally had the effect of making the peninsula more than ever a bone of contention. A petty rebellion breaking out in 1894, 
the king appealed to China, not to Japan, for succor. The insurgents, who called themselves Tunghak, champions of Eastern learning, in opposition to Western innovations, dispersed on the appearance of Chinese troops, and the troops entrenched themselves on the sea coast. The Japanese were notified and exercised their right of sending a force, but instead of camping on the coast, they pushed on to the capital for the better protection of king and court. Both parties, perceiving the real issue, pushed forward their troops as fast as the ships could carry them. Their ostensible object was to annihilate the Tunghaks, the real aim to settle at once and forever the question of Chinese supremacy. They kept up the forms of friendship until the 25th of July, when two collisions in one day compelled them to throw off the mask. Then came the shock of war, as unforeseen as an earthquake, and infinitely more destructive. In the earlier battles, the Chinese fought well, but they soon came to expect defeat as a matter of course. A constant succession of victories telling as much for the organizing talent of Japan at headquarters as for the courage and discipline of her forces in the field. In possession of king and capital, the Japanese enjoyed a great advantage. The poor king, as helpless as Matsuma, bound himself by treaty to furnish supplies for their troops until the independence of Korea should be secured, and allowed himself to be persuaded into insulting his liege lord by assuming the title of emperor. How great their advantage will not be apparent unless we suppose the situation reversed. With a Chinese army in Seoul commanding the resources of the kingdom, who can say that the issue of the conflict might not have been otherwise? In that first bold stroke, the palm of strategy belongs to Japan, an incidental advantage not to be overlooked was the glamour of chivalry which it gave her as the defender of the oppressed, enabling her to inscribe on her banners a noble object. Whatever arrière-pensée she may have indulged, politically this was shrewd, but night and air dream of that sort is out of date. Japan's action in taking the initiative is to be justified, if at all, on the ground that the disguised hostility of the Chinese made war inevitable sooner or later, and it was wise for her to strike when she was ready. Before spring, the Chinese had been driven out of Korea, and the Manchurian seaboard occupied by the Japanese. The two great naval fortresses had fallen into their hands, and the Chinese navy was annihilated. To save her capital, China sued for peace, and Japan stood revealed as a power no longer to be disregarded by the cabinets of Europe. End of section 79. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nikki 504, New Orleans. Section 80 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. The World's Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section eighty the adventures of yao chen yuan one of the four successful messengers to and from tientsin during the boxer war 
the boxers were a secret society whose aim was to drive out the foreigners in nineteen hundred they massacred both missionaries and their converts the great european powers made a formal protest to the chinese government the government was ready to promise anything but secretly aided the boxers the nations sent forth forces to protect their citizens and property war ensued the most horrible tortures of the foreigners and the most ghastly massacres took place encouraged by the empress Wu ambassadors and ministers and other foreigners were shut up together with christian natives in the british legation in peking it was of the utmost importance that messages be sent to tientsin the following is an account of the adventures of one of the messengers the editor when the letters of the various ministers had been committed to my care i returned to su wang fu saying to myself how shall i ever be able to take these letters to tientsin i breathed a simple prayer to god to give me some method by which i might reach my destination in safety the words had scarcely left my lips when i noticed on the wall a large straw hat such as is commonly used by coolies in the summer time and as it was composed of two layers of straw i wet it ripped it apart and concealed my letters between the two sections after which i carefully sewed it together as before with the prayer upon my lips lord when do you wish me to start when i left the legation i crossed the bridge and climbed over a wall of barricades into su wang fu where two japanese soldiers said to me what are you doing here i am going to tientsin with letters i replied what is your name inquired one of them when i told him he said in a kind but warning tone you must be careful or you will be killed before you are well started on your way he took me to a small lane at the outskirts of the barricades where he left me to go on alone but i had not gone far when i discovered that a boxer watchman was stationed at the other end of the street and my heart almost stood still i had gone too far however to turn back so i put on a bold front prayed the lord for guidance and walked boldly onward give me ten cents and i will let you pass was all he said which i was quite ready to do my way through the east gate was without incident but when halfway to tung chu i overtook some three hundred of tung fu xiang's soldiers to whom i joined myself and continued on my way the canal had overflowed its banks at the eight li bridge and at their suggestion we had our dinner for which they paid after which one of them offered to swim across with me on his back which kindness i was glad to accept as i saw no other way of getting to the opposite side i continued with the soldiers stopping with them that night at a mohammedan inn the proprietor of which was very kind to me he refused to accept payment for my entertainment and asked me to take vows of friendship before i left during the night a crowd passed by led by a woman boxer a member of the society of the red lantern who asked me my name my business and where i was going as i seemed to satisfy them with my answer they went about their business which was the destruction of a catholic village and the murder of the christians the next morning i continued on my way being early joined by a boxer who invited me to dine with him after which we separated that night i heard the keeper of the inn at which i stopped say to a boxer we have no christians here and i spent the night in peace 
the following day a child warned me not to go through a certain village saying that the boxers were taking every one they suspected and i saw the fire kindled at which they burnt twenty christians while i at the same time thanked the lord for putting it into the mind of a child to warn me and thus save me and perhaps the people of the legation from a like horrible fate the country was flooded i was compelled to wade through water the depth of which i knew nothing about and i was wet and discouraged i had just emerged from the water when a man with a gun on his shoulder called out to me in a loud voice where are you going i am going to tientsin i answered what for to find the head of a flower establishment in which i was employed before this trouble broke out the readiness of my answer seemed to satisfy him and he allowed me to continue on my way it ought to be said in mr yow's defence that he had been connected with such a business the head of which lived in tientsin so that his answer was not wholly fiction at the next village a shoemaker informed me that the road was dangerous being crowded with chinese troops a thing which i soon found to be true by being made prisoner and having my money taken from me my money being all they wanted the soldiers at once set me free and i in turn complained to the officer that i had been robbed by his troops wait said he until i see who did it no no said i do not let me trouble you to that extent the day is far spent and i should like to spend the night in your camp with pleasure said he so i spent the night in the protection of my enemies please search me said i in the morning to see that i have taken nothing and i will proceed on my way he returned my money warning me not to go on the great road lest i fall into the hands of the foreign troops and suffer at their hands i understand said i with a meaning which he did not comprehend and i left when i came to the river i noticed a boatman and accosted him as follows will you take me to the red bridge in tientsin we do not dare to go as far as the red bridge he answered the japanese soldiers are there and they will shoot us you need not be afraid said i i can protect you from japanese soldiers on hearing this he readily consented but he put me off some distance from the bridge i saw the soldiers in the distance but waved my handkerchief as a token that i was a messenger and thus encountered no danger they escorted me to the foreign settlement and then left me to go alone but the russians refused to allow me to pass and i was compelled to return to the red bridge i took one of the letters out of the hat and showed it to three japanese officers who happened to be passing where do you come from they asked from peking were you not afraid of the boxers no you are a good man wait till i give you a pass while he was writing it began to rain and they took me to their headquarters where i saw a high official dined with him and related all my adventures by the way as well as the condition of affairs in peking all of which he wrote down and then sent four of his soldiers to accompany me to the british and american consulates when i saw the american consul i burst into tears and told him of all that the people in peking were suffering how the boxes were firing on them from all sides and trying to burn them out how each man was limited to a small cup of grain a day while at the same time they were compelled to labour like coolies under a burning sun in employments to which they were not accustomed and i urged him to send soldiers at once to relieve them he sent a man to take me to my room and i found among the servants one of my old acquaintances with whom i spent a pleasant evening and then had a good night's rest the following day i went to the methodist mission where i met those who had passed through a siege similar to the one i had left when dr ben saw how sore my feet were she washed and bandaged them with her own hands after a rest of two days i secured the letters of the various consuls 
together with others from friends of some of the besieged and started on my return journey depending upon the lord for his protection i had not gone a mile from the city when i was arrested by two foreign soldiers robbed of all my money and taken to the tent of their officer who when he saw my pass recognized it as that of a messenger from peking and restored both my money and my liberty two miles from the city i came to a stream i was unable to cross and found myself compelled to return and leave by way of the north gate of the city seven miles from the city i fell into a nest of boxers the head of whom asked me where have you been to tientsin i replied what for to see the head of the flower establishment with which i was connected before this trouble broke out i answered how old is he seventy-six years i replied without hesitation he said no more and i asked if i could dine with them after dinner i said to the head boxer i wish to go to peking can you tell me the safest route for me to take he told me and after wishing him good-bye i left taking the direction he suggested the following day when passing a melon patch watched by boxers i walked up to them and asked them to give me a melon thinking that they would be less likely to disturb me if i first addressed them where are you going they asked to peking i answered can you tell me which road it would be safest for me to take they told me and as in the former case i followed their directions reaching the city without further adventure other than that of avoiding several crowds of boxers and chinese soldiers outside the east gate i ate two bowls of vermicelli while i watched the soldiers and boxers on top of the city wall i went west to the su pai lu then south to the tan pai lu where i turned west toward the british legation all the way through the city i was compelled to saunter slowly as though i was merely looking about and not going anywhere so that it took me from noon till evening to go from the east gate to the legation the soldiers in the lines between the chinese and foreign quarters were gambling as i passed and paid no attention to me in the austrian legation grounds i noticed a chinese soldier digging as though for treasure walking up to him i addressed him thus hello captain what are you doing what are you doing here said he staring at me and speaking in a loud voice please do not speak so loud said i in an undertone as though to enter into a secret alliance with him i was originally a coolie in this place my home is in the country and i have just been to see if my family were killed and finding them safe i have returned to get some treasure i have in the su wang fu how much have you he inquired about one thousand dollars what is your name he inquired further yao chen yuan what is your honourable name wu lien tai he replied now you go and get your silver and we too will open an opium shop very well i replied have you any silver with you he asked only about four or five ounces well you give that to me not that i want the silver but it will cement our friendship and i will return it to you when you come back very well said i giving him what silver i had while we were talking an officer with forty or fifty soldiers came up and wanted to have me killed do not kill him said the soldier to whom i had been talking he is an old friend of mine from the country here to make money out of the foreigners if he is a friend of yours what is his name yao chen yuan he replied what is this soldier's name asked the officer turning to me wu lien tai i answered without hesitation quite right he said and passed on to the great street just then a crowd of boxers came up and the leader asked what is this fellow doing here do not meddle with my affairs said the soldier he is my friend 
and with this they passed on leaving us alone now you go into su wang fu said the soldier and get your money and if you cannot come out to-morrow stand behind the wall and hold your hand aloft that i may know you are safe very well i replied but how am i to get in i will take you to the end of that alley where you will be safe he said at which place i bade him good afternoon in a few moments the japanese soldiers who had observed and recognized me pulled me up over the wall and i was once more safe i was at once taken to the officer and met mr squires to whom i delivered the letters when he saw me ripping open the hat and taking them out one after another until i had given him eleven he could not refrain from laughing he took me with him to the american legation where as we entered he held aloft the letters the people clapped their hands and cheered and many of them wanted to talk with me but i was led out through the russian into the british legation here i met mr king who after a short conversation asked me for my hat it is all ripped apart i replied i can sew it together again he answered what do you want to do with it i inquired take it back to america as a relic of your trip said he while we were talking some one came to say that lady macdonald wanted to see me and hear about my trip to whom i told it much as i have told it to you not even concealing the deceit i was sometimes compelled to practise in order as i then supposed to accomplish my ends end of section eighty this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section eighty one of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section eighty one when the allies entered pekin by pierre loti louis marie julien vio here we are at the gates the double triple gates deep as tunnels and formed of the most powerful masonry gates surmounted by deadly dungeons each one five stories high with strange curved roofs extravagant dungeons colossal black things above a black enclosing wall our horses hoofs sink deeper and deeper disappear in fact in the coal-black dust which is blinding and all-pervading in the atmosphere as well as on the ground in spite of the light rain and the snowflakes which make our faces tingle noiselessly as though we were stepping upon wadding or felt we pass under the enormous vaults and enter the land of ruin and ashes a few slatternly beggars shivering in corners in their blue rags and that is all silence and solitude within as well as without these walls nothing but rubbish and ruin ruin the land of rubbish and ashes and little grey bricks little bricks all alike scattered in countless myriads upon the sites of houses that have been destroyed or upon the pavement of what once were streets little grey bricks this is the sole material of which pekin was built a city of small low houses decorated with a lacework of gilded wood a city of which only a mass of curious debris is left after fire and shell have crumbled away its flimsy materials we have come into the city at one of the corners where there was the fiercest fighting the tartar quarter which contained the european legations 
long straight streets may still be traced in this infinite labyrinth of ruins ahead of us all is grey or black to the sombre grey of the fallen brick is added the monotonous tone which follows a fire the gloom of ashes and the gloom of coal sometimes in crossing the road they form obstacles these tiresome little bricks these are the remains of barricades where fighting must have taken place after a few hundred metres we enter the street of the legations upon which for so many months the anxious attention of the whole world was fixed everything is in ruins of course yet european flags float on every piece of wall and we suddenly find as we come out of the smaller streets the same animation as at tien to sin a continual coming and going of officers and soldiers and an astonishing array of uniforms a big flag marks the entrance to what was our legation two monsters in white marble crouch at the threshold this is the etiquette for all chinese palaces two of our soldiers guard the door which i enter my thoughts recurring to the heroes who defended it we finally dismount amid piles of rubbish in an inner square near a chapel and at the entrance to a garden where the trees are losing their leaves as an effect of the icy winds the walls about us are so pierced with balls that they look like sieves the pile of rubbish at our right is the legation proper destroyed by the explosion of a chinese mine at our left is the chancellor's house where the brave defenders of the place took refuge during the siege because it was in a less exposed situation they have offered to take me in there it was not destroyed but everything is topsy-turvy as though it were the day after a battle and in the room where i am to sleep the plasterers are at work repairing the walls which will not be finished until this evening as a new arrival i am taken on a pilgrimage to the garden where those of our sailors who fell on the field of honour were hastily buried amid a shower of balls there is no grass here no blossoming plants only a grey soil trampled by the combatants crumbling from dryness and cold trees without leaves and with branches broken by shot and over all a gloomy lowering sky with snowflakes that are cutting we remove our hats as we enter this garden for we know not upon whose remains we may be treading the graves will soon be marked i doubt not but have not yet been so one is not sure as one walks of not having underfoot some one of the dead who merits a crown in this house of the chancellor spared as by a miracle the besieged live helter-skelter slept on a floor space the size of which was day by day decreased by the damage done by shot and shell and were in imminent danger of death in the beginning their number alas rapidly diminished there were sixty french sailors and twenty austrians meeting death side by side with equally magnificent courage to them were added a few french volunteers who took their turns on the barricades or on the roofs and two foreigners monsieur and madame rosthorne of the austrian legation our officers in command of the defence were lieutenant d'arcy and midshipman herbert the latter was struck full in the face by a ball and sleeps to-day in the garden the horrible part of the siege was that no pity was to be expected from the besiegers if starved and at the end of their strength it became necessary for the besieged to surrender it was death and death with atrocious chinese refinements to prolong the paroxysms of suffering neither was there the hope of escape by some supreme sortie 
they were in the midst of a swarming city they were enclosed in a labyrinth of buildings that sheltered a crowd of enemies and were still further imprisoned by the feeling that surrounding them walling in the whole was the colossal black rampart of pekin it was during the torrid period of the chinese summer it was often necessary to fight while dying of thirst blinded by dust under a sun as destructive as the balls and with the constant sickening fear of infection from dead bodies yet a charming young woman was there with them an austrian to whom should be given one of our most beautiful french crosses alone amongst men in distress she kept an even cheerfulness of the best kind she cared for the wounded prepared food for the sick sailors with her own hands and then went off to aid in carrying bricks and sand for the barricades or to take her turn as watch on the roof day by day the circle closed in upon the besieged as their ranks grew thinner and the garden filled with the dead gradually they lost ground although disputing with the enemy who were legion every piece of wall every pile of bricks and when one sees their little barricades hastily erected during the night out of nothing at all and knows that five or six sailors succeeded in defending them for five or six toward the end were all that could be spared it really seems as though there were something supernatural about it all as i walked through the garden with one of its defenders and he said to me at the foot of that little wall we held out for so many days and in front of this little barricade we resisted for a week it seemed a marvellous tale of heroism and their last entrenchment it was alongside the house a ditch dug tentatively in a single night banked up with a few poor sacks of earth and sand it was all they had to keep off the executioners who scarcely six metres away were threatening them with death from the top of a wall beyond is the cemetery that is the corner of the garden in which they buried their dead until the still more terrible days when they had to put them here and there concealing the place for fear the graves would be violated in accordance with the terrible custom of this place it was a poor little cemetery whose soil had been pressed and trampled upon in close combat whose trees were shattered and broken by shell the interments took place under chinese fire and an old white-headed priest since a martyr whose head was dragged in the gutter said prayers at the grave in spite of the balls that whistled about him cutting and breaking the branches toward the end their cemetery was the contested region after they had little by little lost much ground and they trembled for their dead the enemy had advanced to its very border they watched and they killed at close quarters over the sleeping warriors so hastily put to rest if the chinese had reached this cemetery and had scaled the last frail trenches of sand and gravel in sacks made of old curtains then for all who were left there would have been horrible torture to the sound of music and laughter horrible dismemberment nails torn off feet torn off disemboweling and finally the head carried through the streets at the end of a pole they were attacked from all sides and in every possible manner often at the most unexpected hours of the night it usually began with cries and the sudden noise of trumpets and tom-toms around them thousands of howling men would appear one must have heard the howlings of the chinese to imagine what their voices are their very timber chills your soul gongs outside the walls added to the tumult occasionally from a suddenly opened hole in a neighbouring house a pole twenty or thirty feet long ablaze at the end with oakum and petroleum emerged slowly and silently like a thing out of a dream this was applied to the roofs in the hope of setting them on fire they were also attacked from below they heard dull sounds in the earth and understood that they were being undermined that their executioners might spring up from the ground at any moment so that it became necessary at any risk 
to attempt to establish countermines to prevent this subterranean peril one day toward noon two terrible detonations which brought on a regular tornado of plaster and dust shook the french legation half burying under rubbish the lieutenant in command of the defences and several of his marines but this was not all all but two succeeded in getting clear of the stones and ashes that covered them to the shoulders but two brave sailors never appeared again and so the struggle continued desperately and under conditions more and more frightful and still the gentle stranger remained when she might so easily have taken shelter elsewhere at the english legation for instance where most of the ministers with their families had found refuge the balls did not penetrate to them they were at the centre of the quarter defended by a few handfuls of brave soldiers and could there feel a certain security so long as the barricades held out but no she remained and continued in her admirable role at that blazing point the french legation a point which was the key the cornerstone of the european quadrangle whose capture would bring about general disaster one time they saw with their field-glasses the posting of an imperial edict commanding that the fire against foreigners cease what they did not see was that the men who put up the notices were attacked by the crowd with knives yet a certain lull a sort of armistice did follow the attacks became less violent they saw that incendiaries were everywhere abroad they heard fusillades cannonades and prolonged cries among the chinese entire districts were in flames they were killing one another their fury was fermenting as in a pandemonium and they were suffocated stifled with the smell of corpses spies came occasionally with information to sell always false and contradictory in regard to the relief expedition which amid ever-increasing anxiety was hourly expected it is here it is there it is advancing or it has been defeated and is retreating were the announcements yet it persisted in not appearing what then was europe doing had they been abandoned they continued almost without hope to defend themselves and their restricted quarters each day they felt that chinese torture and death were closing in upon them they began to lack for the essentials of life it was necessary to economize in everything particularly in ammunition they were growing savage when they captured any boxers instead of shooting them they broke their skulls with a revolver one day their ears sharpened for all outside noises distinguished a continued deep heavy cannonade beyond the great black ramparts whose battlements were visible in the distance and which enclosed them in a dantesque circle pekin was being bombarded it could only be by the armies of europe come to their assistance yet one last fear troubled their joy would not a supreme attack against them be attempted an effort be made to destroy them before the allied troops could enter as a matter of fact they were furiously attacked and this last day the day of their deliverance cost the life of one of our officers captain la brousse who went to join the austrian commander in the glorious little cemetery of the legation but they kept up their resistance until all at once not a chinese head was visible on the barricades of the enemy all was empty and silent in the devastation about them the boxers were flying and the allies were entering the city End of section eighty one this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section eighty two of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by devora allen the World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 82. 
A Diplomatic Correspondence Between the United States and China After the suppression of the Boxer Uprising, representatives of the nations that had lost by the failure of the Chinese government to protect their citizens and property demanded reparation. Nearly $25 million was allotted to this country. The United States, however, in continuance of its former friendship for China, offered to accept only an amount covering the actual loss incurred. 1. Mr. Rockhill to the Prince of Qing Your Highness, it is with great satisfaction that I have the honor to inform Your Highness, under direction of the Secretary of State of the United States, that a bill has passed the Congress of the United States, authorizing the President to modify the indemnity bond given the United States by China from $24,440,000 to $13,655,492.29, with interest at 4% per annum. Of this amount, $2 million are held, pending the result of hearings on private claims presented to the Court of Claims of the United States within one year. Any balance remaining after such adjudication is also to be returned to the Chinese government, in such manner as the Secretary of State shall decide. The President is further authorized under the bill to remit to China the remainder of the indemnity as an act of friendship, such payments and remissions to be made at such times and in such a manner as he may deem just. I am also directed by the Secretary of State to request the Imperial Government kindly to favor him with its views as to the time and manner of the remissions. Trusting that Your Imperial Highness will favor me with an early reply to communicate to my government, I avail myself of this occasion to renew to Your Highness the assurance of my highest consideration. W. W. Rockhill, to His Highness, Prince of Qing, President of the Wai Wu Pu, Board of Foreign Affairs. 2. Prince of Qing to Mr. Rockhill. Translation. July 14, 1908. Your Excellency. I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your dispatch of July 11th, informing me that you had been directed to notify me. Here follows a resume of Mr. Rockhill's letter. On reading this dispatch, I was profoundly impressed with the justice and great friendliness of the American government, and wish to express our sincerest thanks. Concerning the time and manner of the return of the amounts to be remitted to China, the imperial government has no wishes to express in the matter. It relies implicitly on the friendly intentions of the United States government, and is convinced that it will adopt such measures as are best calculated to attain the end it has in view. The imperial government, wishing to give expression to the high value it places on the friendship of the United States, finds in its present action a favorable opportunity for doing so. Mindful of the desire recently expressed by the President of the United States to promote the coming of Chinese students to the United States to take courses in the schools and higher educational institutions of the country, and convinced by the happy results of past experience of the great value to China of education in American schools, the Imperial Government has the honor to state that it is its intention to send henceforth yearly to the United States a considerable number of students, there to receive their education. The Board of Foreign Affairs will confer with the American Minister in Peking concerning the elaboration of plans for the carrying out of the intention of the Imperial Government. A Necessary Dispatch, Seal of the Wai Wu Pu. 3. The Wai Wu Pu to Mr. Rockhill, July 14, 1908. To His Excellency, W. W. Rockhill, American Minister, Peking. Referring to the dispatch just sent to Your Excellency regarding sending students to America, it has now been determined that from the year when the return of the indemnity begins, 100 students shall be sent to America every year for four years, so that 400 students may be in America by the fourth year. From the fifth year and throughout the period of the indemnity payments, a minimum of 50 students will be sent each year. As the number of students will be very great, there will be difficulty in making suitable arrangements for them. Therefore, in the matter of choosing them, as well as in the matters of providing suitable homes for them in America, and selecting the schools which they are to enter, we hope to have your advice and assistance. The details of our scheme will have to be elaborated later, but we take this occasion to state the general features of our plan, and ask you to inform the American government of it. We sincerely hope that the American government will render us assistance in the matter. Wishing you all prosperity. Signed, Prince of Qing, Na Tung, Liang Tun Yen, Yuan Shi Kai, Lian Fang. Already, and quite apart from the scheme proposed in the note of the Wai Wu Pu, 
there are maintained in the United States by imperial and provincial funds 155 Chinese students, picked boys and young men, sons of officials and prominent and wealthy merchants, chosen often by competitive examinations. The students now to be sent annually by the imperial government will be still more carefully selected. These are the men destined for positions of responsibility and influence in that awakening China, of which we hear so much. And because of these things, our schools and colleges, the undergraduates, and the people at large may have sight of the opportunities and possibilities which are theirs and ours. From the Outlook End of Section 82 This recording is in the public domain. Section 83 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Republic of China. The Manchu dynasty has abdicated, after holding the Chinese imperial throne for nearly three centuries. The decree of abdication will be of historic moment. It reads as follows. The whole country is tending towards a republican form of government. It is the will of heaven, and it is certain that we could not reject the people's desire for the sake of one family's honor and glory. We, the Dowager Empress and the Emperor, hand over the sovereignty to the people. We decide the form of government to be a constitutional republic. In this time of transition, in order to unite the South and the North, we appoint Wan Shikai to organize the provisional government consulting the people's army regarding the union of the five peoples manchus chinese mongolians mohammedans and tibetans these peoples jointly constitute the great state of chuang hua mingkus a republic of china we retire to a peaceful life and will enjoy the respectful treatment of the nation this was signed by the empress dowager for herself and the little emperor by Wan Shi Kai as Prime Minister, and also by the other ministers. End of section 83. This recording is in the public domain. Section 84 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Avayi. Korea. Historical Note. Korean history begins with the 12th century BC, when the nation is said to have been founded by one Ki Tse. In BC 108, China conquered and took possession of the country, but soon after the Christian era, Korea regained her independence. The golden age of Korea was from the 10th to the 14th centuries. At length, a palace revolution resulted in the overthrow of Buddhism the banishment of the priests, and the establishment of a dynasty that held the throne until the 20th century. In 1592, the Japanese invaded the country, but with the assistance of a Chinese army, the Koreans at length drove them back. Soon after, the Manchu emperors of China placed Korea under vassalage, and for nearly three centuries, tribute was sent annually to Peking. The Koreans have been even more distrustful of foreigners than were their neighbors, Japan and China, and it was not until 1876 that her ports were opened to foreign trade. By the war of 1894 between China and Japan, Korea was freed from her allegiance to the former nation, only to fall, as the result of the Russo-Japanese War, under the more exacting sway of the latter. In 1910, the Korean king was deposed and his authority transferred to a Japanese governor-general. End of section 84. This recording is in the public domain. Section 85 of China, Japan and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Avai. A Grain Shop in Korea, Photograph, page 264 Among the Koreans are many followers of Confucius, and there are also Buddhist monasteries and Christian missions, 
but the one article of belief that is generally prevalent is the worship of ancestors the ancestral fire must never be allowed to go out the koreans are devoted to their children and the children return this devotion by every possible courtesy and attention the korean houses are of one story built of wood and clay and rice straw the roofs are generally thatched and there are very few windows the illustration shows particularly well the dress of the koreans the men wear huge pairs of white cotton trousers padded with cotton wool and tied around the waist with a long ribbon and tassels the koreans laugh at the folly of foreigners in cutting buttonholes in good cloth their socks are also padded and into them the trousers are thrust and tied at the ankle with ribbon their coats are short tight at the shoulders and have short wide sleeves part of the hair hangs down the back the rest is twisted into a hard little horn at the top of the head they have no pockets but keep money tobacco etc in little silken bags of white blue or orange married men wear hats shaped like an inverted flower pot on a round tray and tied with white ribbon under the chin bachelors wear no hats and are obliged to dress like children the women of korea wear trousers like those of men but over them a short skirt both generally white a tiny jacket of white red or green comes next and over this they put a long green coat throwing it over the head with the sleeves hanging down end of section 85 this recording is in the public domain section 86 of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2018. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 86. When Hideyoshi Invaded Korea, by Homer B. Halbert. As the century wore on and the great Hideyoshi became shogun in Japan, the ambitious designs of that unscrupulous usurper, together with the extreme weakness of Korea, made a combination of circumstances which boded no good for the peninsula people. A succession of bloody civil wars had put into Hideyoshi's hands an immense body of trained veterans, and the cessation of war in japan left this army on his hands without anything to do it could not well be disbanded and it could not safely be kept on a war footing with nothing to do this also gave hideyoshi food for thought and he came to the conclusion that he could kill several birds with one stone by invading korea his main intention was the conquest of china korea was to be but an incident along the way it was necessary to make korea the road by which he should invade china and therefore he sent an envoy suggesting that as he was about to conquer the four corners of the earth korea should give him free passage through her territory or better still should join him in the subjugation of the flowery kingdom to this the king replied that as korea had always been friendly with china and looked upon her as a child upon a parent or as a younger brother upon an elder she could not think of taking such a wicked course after a considerable interchange of envoys hideyoshi became convinced that there was nothing to do but crush korea as a preliminary to the greater work it was in fifteen ninety two that hideyoshi launched his armies at korea he was unable to come himself but he put his forces under the command of Hideyi as chief, while the actual leaders were Kato and Konishi. The Korean and Japanese accounts agree substantially in saying that the Japanese army consisted of approximately 250,000 men. They had 5,000 battle axes, 100,000 long swords, 100,000 short swords, 500,000 daggers, three hundred thousand firearms large and small 
but no cannon. There were fifty thousand horses. Many of the Japanese wore hideous masks with which to frighten the enemy, but it was the musketry that did the work. The Koreans had no firearms at all, and this enormous discrepancy is the second of the main causes of Japanese success. The Koreans could not be expected to stand against trained men armed with muskets. Korea had long expected the invasion, and had kept China well informed of the plans of Hideyoshi and his demands, but when the blow was struck it found Korea unprepared. She had enjoyed the blessings of peace so long that her army had dwindled to a mere posse of police, and her generals were used simply to grace their empty pageants. There may also have been the notion that Japan was simply a medley of half-savage tribes whose armies could not be truly formidable. If so, the Koreans were greatly mistaken. At the first blow it became apparent that Korea could do nothing against the invaders. Husan, Tongna, Kimha, and the other towns along the route to Seoul fell in quick succession. It was found that the Japanese army was too large to advance by a single route, especially as they had to live off the country in large part. So the army divided into three sections. One, led by General Konishi, came north by the middle road. Another, to the east of this, was led by General Kato, and the western one was led by General Kuroda. It was on the seventeenth of the fourth moon that the terrible news of the landing of the Japanese reached Seoul by messenger, though the fire signals flashing from mountain top to mountain top had already signified that trouble had broken out. The king and the court were thrown into a panic, and feverish haste was used in calling together the scattered remnants of the army. The showing was extremely meagre. A few thousand men, poorly armed and entirely lacking in drill, were found, but their leaders were even worse than the men. It was resolved to send this inadequate force to oppose the Japanese at the great cho Ryung, or Bird Pass, where tens of men in defense were worth thousands in attack. The doughty general Shil Yip led this forlorn hope, but ere the pass was reached the gruesome tales of the Japanese prowess reached them, and Shil Yip determined to await the coming of the enemy on a plain where he deemed that the battle flails of the Koreans would do better execution than among the mountains. The pass was, therefore, undefended, and the Japanese swarmed over, met Shil Yip with his ragged following, swept them from their path, and hurried on towards Seoul. We must pause a moment to describe the Japanese leaders, Kato and Konishi, who were the animating spirits of the invasion. Kato was an old man and a conservative. He was withal an ardent Buddhist and a scholar of the old school. He was disgusted that such a young man as Konishi was placed in joint command with him. This Konishi was a new school man, young and clever. He was a Roman Catholic convert, and in every respect the very opposite of Kato, except in bravery and self-assertion. They proved to be flint and steel to each other. They were now vying with one another, which would reach Seoul first. Their routes had been decided by lot, and Konishi had proved fortunate, but he had more enemies to meet than Kato, and so their chances were about even. General Yi Il was the ranking Korean field officer, and he, with four thousand men, was hurried south to block the path of the Japanese wherever he chanced to meet them. He crossed Bird Pass and stationed his force at Sungju, in the very track of the approaching invaders. But when his scouts told him the numbers and the armaments of the foe, he turned and fled back up the pass. This was bad enough, but his next act was treason, for he left the pass where ten men could have held a thousand in check, and put a wide stretch of country between himself and that terrible foe. He is not much to blame, considering the following that he had. He never stood up and attempted to fight the Japanese, but fell back as fast as they approached. Konishi, with his forces, reached the banks of the Han River first, but there were no boats with which to cross, 
and the northern bank was defended by the Koreans, who here had a good opportunity to hold the enemy in check. But the sight of that vast array was too much for the Korean general in charge, and he retreated with his whole force, after destroying all his engines of war. Meanwhile, Seoul was in turmoil indeed. There was no one to man the walls, the people were in a panic of fear, messengers were running wildly here and there. Everything was in confusion. Some of the king's advisers urged him to flee to the north, others advised to stay and defend the city. He chose the former course, and on that summer night, at the beginning of the rainy season, he made hasty preparations and fled out the west gate along the Peking Road. Behind him the city was in flames. The people were looting the government storehouses, and the slaves were destroying the archives in which were kept the slave deeds, for slaves were deeded property, like real estate, in those days. The rain began to fall in torrents, and the royal cortege was drenched to the skin. Food had not been supplied in sufficient quantities, and the king himself had to go hungry for several hours. Seven days later he crossed the Tadong River, and was safe for a time in Pyongyang. Meanwhile the Japanese were reveling in Seoul. Their great mistake was this delay. If they had pushed on resolutely and without delay, they would have taken China unprepared, but they lingered by the way and gave time for the preparation of means for the ultimate victory of the Koreans. The country was awakening from the first stupor of fear, and loyal men were collecting forces here and there and drilling them in hope of ultimately being able to give the Japanese a home thrust. Strong though the Japanese army was, it laboured under certain difficulties. It was cut off from its source of supplies and was living on the country. Every man that died by disease or otherwise was a dead loss, for his place could not be filled. This inability to obtain reinforcements was caused by the loyalty and the genius of Admiral Yi Sun Shin, a Korean whose name deserves to be placed beside that of any of the world's great heroes. Assuming charge of the Korean fleet in the south, he had invented a curious iron clad in the shape of a tortoise. The back was covered with iron plates and was impervious to the fire of the enemy. With his boat he met and engaged a Japanese fleet, bringing sixty thousand reinforcements to Hideyoshi's army. With his swift tortoise boat he rammed the smaller Japanese craft left and right, and soon threw the whole fleet into confusion. Into the struggling mass he threw fire arrows, and a terrible conflagration broke out, which destroyed almost the entire fleet. A few boats escaped and carried the news of the disaster back to Japan. This may be called the turning point in the war, for although the Japanese forces went as far as Pyongyang, and the king had to seek asylum on the northern frontier, yet the spirit of the invasion was broken. China, moved at last by Korea's appeals, was beginning to wake up to the seriousness of the situation, and the Japanese, separated so long from their homes and entirely cut off from Japan, were beginning to be anxious. The mutual jealousies of the Japanese leaders also had their effect, so that, when the allied Koreans and Chinese appeared before Pyongyang and began to storm the place, the Japanese were glad enough to steal away by night and hurry southward. They were pursued, and it was not till they had gone back as far as the capital that they could rest long enough to take breath. It should be noted that China did not come to the aid of Korea until the backbone of the invasion was practically broken. It was a pity that Korea did not have an opportunity to finish off the Japanese single hand. With no hope of reinforcement, the Japanese army would have been glad to make terms and retire, but the peculiar actions of the Chinese, which gave rise to the suspicion that they had been tampered with by the Japanese, gave the latter ample time to reach the southern coast and fortify themselves there. The very presence of the Chinese tended to retard the growth of that national spirit among the Koreans, which led them to arm in defense of their country. It might have been the beginning of a new Korea, even as the recent war gives hopes of the beginning of a new Russia, 
by awakening her to her own needs. Entrenched in powerful forts along the southern coast, the Japanese held on for two full years, the Koreans swarming about them and doing good service at guerrilla warfare. Countless are the stories told of the various bands of patriots that arose at this time and made life a torment for the invaders. The Japanese at last began to use diplomacy in order to extricate themselves from their unpleasant position. Envoys passed back and forth between Korea and China continually, and at last, in the summer of 1596, the Japanese army was allowed to escape to Japan. This was a grievous mistake. Konishi was willing to get away to Japan, because the redoubtable Admiral Yi Sun Shin was still alive, and so long as he was on the sea, the Japanese could not hope to bring reinforcements to the peninsula. They had lost already 180,000 men at the hands of this Korean Nelson, and they were afraid of him. We here meet with one of the results of party strife, the seeds of which had been sown half a century earlier. When the immediate pressure of war was removed, the various successful generals began vilifying each other and laying the blame for the initial disasters upon one another. Not a few of the very best men were either killed or stripped of honours. Some of them retired in disgust and refused to have anything more to do with a government that was carried on in such a way. But the most glaring instance of all this was that of Admiral Yi Sun Shin. When the Japanese went back to their own country, they began to plan another invasion, this time for the less ambitious purpose of punishing Korea. Only one thing was necessary to their success. Admiral Yi must be gotten out of the way. Korean accounts say that this was accomplished as follows. A Korean who had attached himself to the fortunes of the Japanese was sent by the latter back to Korea, and he appeared before one of the Korean generals and offered to give some very important information. It was that a Japanese fleet was coming against Korea, and it would be very necessary to send Admiral Yi Sun Shin to intercept it at a certain group of islands. The king learned of this, and immediately ordered the admiral to carry out this work. Admiral Yi replied that the place mentioned was very dangerous for navigation, and that it would be far better to await the coming of the Japanese at a point nearer the Korean coast. His detractors used this as a handle, and charged him with treason in not obeying the word of the king. After refusing for a second time to jeopardize his fleet in this way, he was shorn of office and degraded to the ranks. He obeyed without a murmur. This was precisely what the Japanese were waiting for. Hearing that the formidable Yi was out of the way, they immediately sailed from Japan. The Korean fleet had been put under the command of a worthless official who fled from before the enemy, and thus allowed the Japanese to land a second time. This was in the first moon of 1597, and it took a thousand boats to bring the Japanese army. When it landed, all was again in turmoil. A hasty appeal was made to China for help, and a loud cry was raised for the reinstatement of Admiral Yi Sun Shin in his old station. This was done, and he soon cut off the new army of invasion from its source of supplies, and had them exactly where they were before. But this time the Japanese army did not have its own way upon the land as in the former case. The Koreans had been trained to war. Firearms had been procured, and their full initiation into Japanese methods had prepared them for defense. Small bands of Koreans swarmed about the Japanese, cutting off a dozen here and a score there, until they were glad to get behind the battlements of their forts. A powerful army of the Japanese started for Seoul by the western route, but they were made in Chiksan by the allied Koreans and Chinese, and so severely whipped that they never again attempted to march on the capital. For a time the war dragged on, neither side scoring any considerable victories, and in truth for part of the time there was so little fighting that the Japanese settled down like immigrants and tilled the soil, and even took wives from among the peasant women. But in 1598 it was decided that a final grand effort must be made to rid the country of them. 
the japanese knew that their cause was hopeless and they only wanted to get away safely they had some boats but they dared not leave the shelter of the guns of their forts for fear that they would be attacked by admiral yi sun shin they tried to bribe the chinese generals and it is said that in this they had some success but when relying on this they boarded their vessels and set sail for japan they found that the famous admiral was not included in the bargain for he came out at them and in the greatest naval battle of the war destroyed almost the whole fleet in the battle he was mortally wounded but he did not regret this for he saw that his country was freed of invaders and he felt sure that his enemies at court would eventually compass his death even if he survived the war it was during this second invasion that the japanese shipped back to japan a large number of pickled ears and noses of koreans which were buried at kyoto the place is shown today and stands a mute memorial of as savage and wanton an outrage as stains the record of any great people during the years of japanese occupancy they sent back to japan enormous quantities of booty of every kind the koreans were skilled in making a peculiar kind of glazed pottery which the japanese admired very much so they took the whole colony bodily to japan with all their implements and set them down in western japan to carry on their industry this succeeded so well that the celebrated satsuma ware was the result the remnants of the descendants of the koreans are still found in japan only a few years elapsed before the japanese applied to the korean government to be allowed to establish a trading station at fusan or rather to re-establish it permission was granted and elaborate laws were made limiting the number of boats that could come annually the amount of goods that they could bring and the ceremonies that must be gone through the book in which these details are set down is of formidable size the perusal of it shows conclusively that japan assumed a very humble attitude and that korea treated her at best no better than an equal this trading station may be called the back door of korea for her face was ever toward china and while considerable trade was carried on by means of these annual trading expeditions of the japanese it was as nothing compared with the trade that was carried on with china by junk and overland through manchuria end of section eighty six section eighty seven of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by abai japan part one in ancient times historical note the history of japan like that of china begins with a time of legend and myth when gods and demigods mingled in the affairs of men it was probably about fifteen hundred years before the birth of christ when the first bands of mongolians arrived from the continent of asia and began the work of wresting the islands from the original inhabitants the ainus but it is not until six hundred sixty b c with the coming of jimu tenno leader of a fresh band of invaders that even legendary history begins in five hundred fifty two a d buddhist missionaries arrived from korea bringing with them writing calendars and methods of computing time and soon after buddhism was proclaimed the state religion by the seventh century the power of the mikado or emperor had become subordinated to that of the court officials during the twelfth century the great families of the taira and minamoto contended for the power and this struggle known as the wars of genji and heike has ever since been a favorite subject for the writer and the artist end of section eighty seven this recording is in the public domain section eighty eight of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the world story volume one 
China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ifa March Tepan. Section 88. Jimmu Tenno, the first Mikado of Japan, by William Eliot Griffith. In the beginning, heaven and earth were not yet separated. Chaos, enveloping all things like an egg, contained a germ. The clear, airy substance expanded and became heaven. The heavy and thick part coagulated and became the earth. Then the young land floated in the water like oil and drifted about like a jellyfish. Out of this warm earth sprouted a bush-like object from which were born two deities, pleasant weed shoot prince Edagod and the deity standing eternally in heaven. After these heavenly deities, seven generations of gods were born. Their names are the deities standing eternally on earth, luxurian thick mud master, mud earth lord, mud earth lady, and others with very long names, usually ending in the word Mikoto, which we translate Augustness. These kami or gods, though in pairs called a generation, were each single and had no sex, but the last two of the series were Izanagi and Izanami, and their names mean the male who invites and the female who invites. After these seven divine generations had come into existence, all the heavenly gods, granting to Izanagi and Izanami a heavenly jeweled spear, commanded the pair to make, consolidate, and give life to the drifting land. The two gods stood on the floating bridge of heaven, and Izanagi pushed down the jeweled spear and stilled the soft warm mud and salt water. When the spear was drawn up, the drops that fell from it sickened and found the island of the congealed drop. In common geography, this island is Awaji, at the entrance of the inland sea. Upon this, the two gods descended, and, planting the jeweled spear in the ground, they made it the central pillar of a palace. They then separated to walk round the island. When they met, Izanami, the female god, cried out, How lovely to meet a handsome male! Izanagi was offended that the female had spoken first, and demanded that the tour round the island be repeated. Meeting the second time, Izanagi, the male god, spoke first and cried out, How joyful to meet a lovely female! Thus began the art of love. Then followed the creation of the various islands of Japan, and all the gods who live on earth are called the earthly deities. These earthly gods married among each other, and from them were born many good things, such as rice, wheat, millet, beans, sorghum, and other articles of food. And gradually the earth was filled with trees and plants and beautiful objects, as gems and shells and waves. Down below the earth was the land of roots, or home of darkness. Izanami, when offended at her husband, fled to this palace and died in giving birth to the god of fire. Izanagi had to go after her to win her back. He found it a region of awful fullness, and his wife a mass of worms. Rushing out, he washed himself in the sea, and from the rinsing were born a great many evil gods. These trouble the good gods and vex and annoy mankind. But out of his left eye was born a beautiful maiden whose body shone brilliantly. This time the heaven and earth were close together, united by a pillar. Going up this pillar into heaven, Izanagi's beautiful daughter became the sun, or the heaven-illuminating goddess. Izanagi's son became the moon, and was commanded to rule the blue plain of the sea and multitudinous salt waters. The names of these two are Amaterasu and Susanoo. As the early gods and evil deities multiplied, and confusion reigned on the earth, the sun goddess, or heaven illuminator, resolved to send her grandson, Ninigi, down to earth to rule over it. She gave him three precious treasures, a mirror, the emblem of her own soul, a sword of divine temper, which her brother had taken from the tail of an eight-headed dragon which she had slain, and a ball of crystal without a flaw. Great was the day when the mighty company of gods, escorting Ninigi, marched down out of heaven and, on the floating bridge of heaven, by which the two heavenly gods had first descended, came down to earth. Reaching the top of the great mountain Kirishima, which lies between Satsuma and Hyuga, they descended into the wild regions of Japan. Ninigi began at once to reduce the earthly gods in order and maintain good government. Heaven and earth now grew wider and wider apart and at last separated, so that communication was no longer possible. The sons of Ninigi were named Princess Fire Fate and Fire Glow. While fishing, they had a quarrel and Prince Firefade went down beneath the sparkling ocean waves to Ryugu, 
the palace of the dragon king of the world under the sea there he married the king's daughter the jewel princess after a time spent in the undersea world the dragon king or ocean possessor sent prince firefade back to earth on the back of a crocodile armed with jewels of ebbing and flowing tides with these he was able to cause or quail a flood of waters he raised one that threatened to drown the whole world and then his brother prince fireglow behaved himself prince fireglow begged pardon and became the servant of his brother who possessed the wonderful tide jewels prince firefade now built a hut on the seashore and roofed it with cormorant wings here was born the child that became jimmu tenno the great-grandson of the sun goddess and the first mikado of japan prince firefade filled with curiosity ventured to peep into the hut roofed with cormorant wings there he saw only a crocodile eight fathoms long which crawled into the sea and plunged down to the dragon king's palace far below and the child thus born of a sea monster grew up to be a great warrior and after many years conquests made himself a master of the island now called kyushio one day on coming to the edge of the sea he saw a tiny little earth god riding towards him in the shell of a tortoise raising his wings as he came knowing the sea path he became jimmu's guide to naniwa near the place now called osaka on landing with his army and fighting the enemy the brother of jimmu was mortally wounded in his hand by an arrow ascribing this calamity to the fact that they had marched against or in face of the sun they turned and made their way round to the southern side with their back to the sun meanwhile the heavenly gods came to jimmu's aid and dropped a sort of divine temper through the roof of a storehouse owned by a native of the region he brought and presented it to jimmu before this sword the enemy fell down the heavenly gods also sent a crow eight feet long to guide the army many earthly gods ancestors of tribes now submitted themselves to jimmu at a great cave eighty earth riders were hiding which he attacked and killed so having thus subdued the savage deities and extirpated the rebellious people jimmu built a palace at kashiwabara the oak moor in yamato there he married the princess ahira jimmu died when one hundred and thirty-seven years old thus began the dynasty of the emperor of everlasting great japan unbroken from ages eternal end of section eighty eight this recording is in the public domain section eighty nine of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section eighty nine the japanese storyteller by sir edwin arnold the hanashika or storyteller of japan is a highly popular personage in town and country who possessing a good voice and tuneful ear and being primed full of the legends and records which best suit native taste gives his primitive but very alluring entertainments in one spot after another as he trudges along the tokiado or any other main road of the empire the general place for the performances is a large upper room over the principal shop of the village street in front of the entrance will be planted bamboo flagstaffs with dark blue banners laced vertically to them bearing the name of the performer and perhaps the titles of some of the tales or songs which he proposes to offer during the day an assistant will perambulate the village beating a drum and blowing a horn after which he proclaims at every corner the eminent gifts of his sensei and invites the public to be present at evening you go with the crowd dropping off shoes or slippers at the foot of the polished ladder leading to the yose as the hall of entertainment is called you may enter for the modest price of four sen or two pence after which if desirous to be ranked with a quality an additional payment of ten sen or five pence will give you a right to the very best situation upon the mats 
and to a cushion on the floor as well as a tobacco box and teapot with perhaps a fan the narrator sits cross-legged before a low desk sukuye holding in his left hand a fan or bamboo paper knife with which he beats energetically upon his desk at the critical passages of his story the company listen with the admirable patience and politeness of the race and if at all bored smoke extra pipes and drink incessant tea generally they are very much amused and that too by the simplest stories for the reciter intersperses his prose with vivid gestures snatches of singing and ejaculations that wake up the sleepiest while if there be many children present he will perhaps narrate one of the old fairy tales of japan which everybody loves like this which mrs james so well translated of the fisher boy who married the princess the fisher boy urashima long ago there lived on the coast of the sea of japan a young fisherman named urashima a kindly lad and clever with his net and line one day he went out in his boat to fish but instead of catching any fish he caught a big tortoise with a hard shell a wrinkled ugly face and a foolish tail tortoises always live a thousand years at least japanese tortoises do so urashima thought to himself a fish would do for my dinner just as well as this tortoise in point of fact better why should i kill the poor thing and prevent it from enjoying itself for another nine hundred and ninety-nine years no no i won't be so cruel and with these words he threw the tortoise back into the sea the next incident that happened was that Hiroshima went to sleep in his boat for it was one of those hot summer days when the sea rocks its children to slumber and as he slept there came up from beneath the waves a beautiful girl who climbed into the boat and said i am the daughter of the sea god and i live with my father in the dragon palace beyond the waves it was not a tortoise that you caught just now and so kindly threw back into the water instead of killing it it was myself my father the sea god had sent me to see whether you were good or bad in your inmost heart we now know that you are good and kind and do not like to do cruel things and so i have come to fetch you you shall marry me if you please and we will live happily together for a thousand years in the dragon palace beyond the deep blue sea so urashima took one oar and the sea god's daughter took the other and they rowed till at last they came to the dragon palace where the sea god lived and ruled is king over all the dragons and tortoises and crabs and fishes the walls of the palace were of coral the trees had emeralds for leaves and rubies for berries the fishes scales were of silver and the dragons tails of solid gold all the most beautiful glittering things that have ever been seen met together there and the liveliest imagination will never picture what this palace looked like it all belonged to Arashima. here they lived very happily for countless years wandering about every day among the beautiful trees with emerald leaves and ruby berries but one morning Arashima said to his wife i am quite happy with you delightful one still I want to go home and see my father and mother and brothers and sisters permit me to depart for a short time and by truth of my love i will soon be back again i don't like you to go 
said she, I am very much afraid that something dreadful will happen. However, if you will go, there is no help for it. Only you must take this box, which will protect you, on condition that you are very careful not to open it. When you open it, you will never be able to come back here. So Urashima promised to take great care of the box, and not to open it on any account. And then, getting into his boat, he rowed off, and at last landed on the shore of his own country. But much had happened while he had been away. Whither had his father's cottage gone? What had become of the village where he used to live? The mountains, indeed, were there as before, but the trees on them had been cut down. The little brook that ran close by his father's cottage was still running, but there were no women washing clothes in it any more. It seemed very strange that everything should have changed so much in three short years. Just then, two men chanced to pass along the beach, and Arashima went up to them and said, Can you tell me, if you please, to what spot Arashima's cottage, which used to stand here, has been moved? Arashima, said they. Why, it is four hundred years ago since he was drowned out fishing. His parents and his brothers and their great-great-grandchildren are all dead long ago. It is an old, very old story. How can you be so foolish as to ask after his cottage? It fell to pieces hundreds of years ago. Then it suddenly flashed across Urashima's mind that the sea god's palace beyond the waves, with its coral walls and its ruby fruits and its dragons with tails of solid gold, must be part of fairyland, and that one day in that land was probably as long as a year in this world, so that his swift years in the sea god's palace had really endured for hundreds of years. Of course, there was no use in staying at home, now that all his friends were dead and buried, and even the village had passed away. So Rashima was in a great hurry to get back to his wife, the dragon princess, beyond the sea. But which was the way? He could not find it without anyone to show it to him. Perhaps, thought he, if I open the box which she gave me, I shall be able to learn the road. So he disobeyed her orders not to open the box. Or, possibly, he forgot them. Anyhow, he opened the box, and out of it came... What? Here, the fan of our storyteller would furiously beat the desk. Nothing but a white cloud which floated away over the sea. Irashma shouted to the cloud to stop, rushed about and screamed with sorrow, for he remembered now what his wife had told him, and how, after opening the box, he should never be able to go to the sea god's palace again. But soon he could neither run nor shout any more. Suddenly his hair grew as white as snow. His face got wrinkled, and his back bent like that of a very old man. Then his breath stopped short, and he fell down dead on the beach. Ah, Zanyan, Zanyan, woe for Urashima. He died because he had been foolish and disobedient. If only he had done as he was told, he might have lived another thousand years. If we could only go and see the dragon palace beyond the waves, where the sea god lives and rules as king over the dragons and the tortoises and the fishes, where the trees have emeralds for leaves and rubies for berries, 
where the fishes' tails are of silver and the dragon's tails all of solid gold never would we open that stupid box no end of section eighty nine this recording is in the public domain section ninety of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section ninety the fisher boy arashima by unknown tis spring and the mist comes stealing o'er sumi noye's shore and i stand by the seaside musing on the days that are no more i muse on the old world story as the boats glide to and fro of the fisher boy urashima who a fishing loved to go how he came not back to the village though seven suns had risen and set but rode on past the bounds of ocean and the sea god's daughter met how they pledged their faith to each other and came to the evergreen land and entered the sea god's palace so lovingly hand in hand to dwell for a in that country the ocean maiden and he the country where youth and beauty abide eternally but the foolish boy said to-morrow i'll come back with thee to dwell but i have a word to my father a word to my mother to tell the maiden answered a casket i give into thine hand and if that thou hopest truly to come back to the evergreen land then open it not i charge thee open it not i beseech so the boy rode home o'er the billows to suminoye's beach but where is his native hamlet strange hamlets line the strand where is his mother's cottage strange cots rise on either hand what in three short years since i left it he cries in his wonder sore has the home of my childhood vanished is the bamboo fence no more perchance if i open the casket which the maiden gave to me my home in the dear old village will come back as they used to be and he lifts the lid and there rises a fleecy silvery cloud that floats off to the evergreen country and the fisher boy cries aloud he waves the sleeve of his tunic he rolls over on the ground he dances with fury and horror running wildly round and round but a sudden chill comes o'er him that bleaches his raven hair and furrows with hoary wrinkles the form er so young and fair his breath grows fainter and fainter till at last he sinks dead on the shore and i gaze on the spot where his cottage once stood but now stands no more of this legend of urashima basil hall chamberlain says urashima's tomb together with his fishing line the casket given him by the maiden and two stones said to be precious are still shown at one of the temples in Kanagaha near Yokohama, and by most of even the educated Japanese, the story, thus historically and topographically certified, is accepted as literally true. According to the official annals, the boy was absent from 477 A.D. to 825 A.D. The Editor End of section 90. This recording is in the public domain.
section ninety one of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section ninety one social life in kyoto by william elliot griffiths social life in kyoto was the standard for that in good society everywhere throughout the empire etiquette was cultivated with almost painful earnestness and the laws about costume were equally rigid tea was introduced into japan by a buddhist priest in the year eight hundred and five and soon became a common drink the oldest tea plantations and the most luscious leaves are at uji near kyoto the preparation and serving of the beverage were matters upon which much attention was bestowed the making of cups dishes and all facilities for drinking was greatly stimulated by the use of the hot drink and when the potter's wheel was brought over from korea the ceramic art entered upon a new era of development flowers and gardens were much enjoyed and visits of ceremony were many and prolonged the invention of the fan was not at first thought to be an aid to good manners but it soon won its way to favour as early as the seventh century it came into use for personal comfort in course of time the fan developed into many varieties the couge or court nobles had one kind and the court ladies with their long hair sweeping down their back to their feet and arrayed in white and crimson silk had another in art we see that the dragon queen of the underworld holds a flat fan with double wings the long-nosed king of the tengus or mountain sprites who is said to have taught yoshitsune his wisdom and secrets of power holds a fan exactly like the old pulpit feather fans which it once was thought proper for clergymen to make use of the judges at wrestling matches flourish a peculiar sort while in war the white who received a thwack over the noddle with the huge iron bone fan might lie in gore the firemen of kyoto and the men in the procession in honour of the sun goddess at ise carry fans that would cool the face of a giant the earliest fans were all of the flat kind but in the seventh century it is said that a man of tamba seeing that bats could fold their wings imagined that the motion and effect could be imitated accordingly he made the oji or fan that opens and shuts this was a great advantage securing economy in space and ease of use another story declares that when the widow of a young tyra noble slain in the civil wars retired to a temple to hide her grief she cured the abbot of a fever by fanning him folding a piece of paper in plaits and then opening it out muttering incantations the while the lady brought great prosperity to the temple for thereafter the priests excelled in making folding fans from the sale of these novelties a steady revenue flowed into the temple in time the name of this temple was adopted by fan makers all over the country as a shelter of the face or bare head from the sun for hats and bonnets were not fashionable in old japan for use as trays or salvers to hand flowers letters or presents to friends or to one's master as thoughtful defences against one's breath while talking to superiors and for a thousand polite uses to say nothing of its value as an article of dress the folding fan is a distinctly japanese gift to civilization it had many centuries of history and honor in japan before the chinese borrowed the invention in the cast of fashion the flat fan which too often sank to the level of a dustpan grain winnower or fire blower is in the lowest grade the chief food as well as the ceremonial drink came from rice 
this grain was imported from korea and very early became the standard article of diet among the upper classes the japanese have never yet learned to like bread nor is rice usually the food of the poorer people the best rice is raised in higo it is cooked served and flavoured in a great variety of ways and many extracts and preparations such as gluten mochi or pastry flour and alcohol are made from it the making of sake by which we mean beer wine or brandy made from rice is as old as the first commerce with korea it was the favourite drink of japanese men and gods the festivals in celebration of the planting reaping and offering of rice in the sheaf or hauled and cleaned and of the fermentation or presentation of the liquor to the gods form a notable feature in the shinto religion this sake or brewed rice was the drink enjoyed at feasts poetry parties picnics and evening gatherings like tea it was heated and drunk when hot besides the pleasures of music poetry and literature cards checkers games of skill and chance of many kinds even to the sniffing of perfumes helped the hours of leisure to pass pleasantly outdoor sports were also diligently cultivated by these elegantly dressed lords and ladies of the capital the ladies amused themselves by catching fireflies and various brilliantly coloured or singing insects by feeding the goldfish in the garden ponds or viewing the moon and the landscape the delights of the young men were in horsemanship archery football and falconry the art of training falcons to hunt and kill the smaller or defenceless birds was copied from korea and has been practised in japan somewhat over a thousand years cock-fights dog-matches and fishing by means of cormorants were also common a method of racing and shooting from horseback at dogs with blunt arrows was cultivated for the sake of skill in riding polo is said to have come from persia into china and thence to japan where it is called ball striking or da kiyu a polo outfit with elegant costume and the liveliest of ponies was costly so that polo like hawking was always an aristocratic game the warrior's dance had been described as a giant quadrille in armour the more robust and exciting exercise of hunting the boar deer bear and other wild animals was often indulged in by the military men in time of peace in order to keep up their vigour and discipline in hunting the bold riders and footmen could have something like the excitement of war with only a small amount of its danger this curious social life in old kyoto is quite fully shown in japanese art in books and pictures and the theatre and is a favourite subject for the poets novelists and artists on fans paper napkins lacquer ware carved ivories bronzes sword hilts and all the rich and strange artworks of old japan this court life can be pleasantly studied it was a state of things which existed before feudalism came in completely to alter the face of the mikado's empire and before chinese learning pedantry and literary composition cramped the native genius he who understands the method and meaning of the artist has a great fund of enjoyment the painter and carver or even the decorator on a five-cent fan tells his tale well and one who knows japanese life from its ancient and mediaeval literature as well as by modern travel and study needs no interpreter best of all however life in the mikado's capital is reflected in the classic fiction written in the middle ages and mostly by ladies of the court from a literary point of view the women of japan did more to preserve and develop their native language than the men the masculine scholars used chinese and composed their books in what was as latin to the mass of the people the lady writers employed their own beautiful speech and such famous manga tari or novels as the sago romo genji isei and others besides hundreds of volumes of poetry in pure classical japanese are from their pens a number of famous novels the oldest of which is the old bamboo cutter's story which dates from the tenth century 
picture the life and work the loves and adventures of the lads and lasses priests and warriors lords and ladies in this extremely refined highly polished and very licentious society of kyoto a thousand years or less ago those who would study it carefully must read mr chamberlain's classical poetry of the japanese or mr sayamatsu's genji monogatari miss harris's log of a japanese journey is a rendering in english of the tosa niki or diary of the voyage from tosa to kyoto of the famous poet tsura yuki the tosa niki book is a great favourite with native students on account of its beauty of style tsura yuki was appointed by the mikado to be governor of tosa after serving four years he starts homeward for kyoto by ship and carriage or rather by junk and bullock cart he left tosa in january a d nine hundred and thirty five and the diary of his voyage is written in woman's style of writing that is in pure japanese he calls himself a certain person and is a jolly good-natured fellow always when opportunity serves writing poetry and enjoying the sake cup as japanese junks usually wait for the wind sail only in the daytime or at least not all night and keep out of storms if possible he stopped at many places where official friends called upon him and presents were exchanged cups of sake drunk and poems written most of the presents had verses tied to them but the pheasants had a flowering branch of the plum tree attached we translate a stanza as o'er the waves we urge while roars the whitening surge louder shall rise my cry that left behind am i whereat the traveller notes in his diary that the poet must have a pretty loud voice he tells of the storks and the fir trees which have been comrades for a thousand years how the passengers went ashore at one place to take a hot bath how a sailor caught a tie or a splendid red fish for his dinner jests at the bush of the man in the moon throws his metal mirror in the sea to quiet the storm raised by the god of sumi yoshi escapes the pirates with whom he had as governor dealt very severely and completes his sea journey not at osaka which did not then exist but at yamazaki near the capital there he waits for a bullock car to come from kyoto which he must of course enter in state as becomes a kuje or noble this charming little book shows first that human nature in japan a thousand years ago was wonderfully like that of to-day in japan or anywhere else that good style will make a book live as long as the rocks and that in those days the spoken idiom differed very little from the language employed in literature brave tsura yuki he wrote in woman's style really because he loved his native tongue and did not want to see it overlaid by the chinese in our days not a few japanese are heartily ashamed that their own beautiful language has not been more developed by scholars so much dependence on china has paralyzed originality and weakened intellect after fifteen hundred years the patriotic japanese feels ashamed that the literary and intellectual product of his country is so small and that the best work in his native tongue has been done by women no wonder he does not always take kindly to the fulsome flatteries of europeans who tell him what a wonderful fellow he is and how much superior japanese civilization is to that of europe how he really feels about the matter is shown in his eager desire on the one hand to absorb all the ideas and adopt all the inventions of the foreigners and on the other to bridge the gulf between the spoken and the written forms of his own vernacular end of section ninety one this recording is in the public domain read by jim locke of floyd virginia